It's my pleasure to introduce Michael Mosleth King, who is an Egyptologist, classicist, and doctoral candidate at the University of Bristol, where you are taking up a post as lecturer in ancient history in September. Isn't that right? Congratulations. That's Thank fantastic. you. Then. <laughs> yes, bravo. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Her wider interests include the reception of the ancient world in her recently published um, uh, Ancient Astronauts and Sumerian Aliens, uh, which appeared in the University of Birmingham's Classics Ancient History and Archaeology Journal Rosetta. So you're kind of at home here. Yeah, I, I feel <laughs> it's like home. Yeah. Lovely to have you, Mike, and over to you. Thank you. Um, so yeah, like many of you, this is my first in-person conference presentation for about three years now. So, so nice to be here and see everyone. The uh, topic I'll be talking about is um, the reception of Tutankhamun in computer games, specifically the game Assassin's Creed Origin. So, this is, um, this is part of a big franchise, it's not a, a single game. So the storyline of this game follows the, the law established in the previous games in the franchise. So just a little bit about the actual overarching law. We have a bit of an Atlantean concept going on. We have something that's in the game called the Isu civilization. And they are essentially very technologically advanced humanoids who went extinct about 75,000 BC. So this very clearly draws on the concept of the, of the lost continent of Atlantis, the lost people of Atlantis. We also find uh, through in-game dialogue and, and various documents in the game, we find that some Isu individuals didn't actually die. They were able to sort of survive in a, in a digital form. And these digital humanoids were worshipped as gods by humans. So these became the gods of for example, the Romans and Egyptians and so on. We find as well that the Isu artifacts and ruins are scattered all over the world. They, have, they hold this immense power. They are mystical kind of artifacts and they are shown to have shaped events in human history. So in the games, in every single game, we find that these artifacts are sought after by two organizations if you will so we have the assassins and of course the game assassin's creed we we, we follow the assassins but they have a, an enemy organization called the templars so both of these organizations are seeking these kind of artifacts and um, the templars are trying to use the artifacts in order to obtain strict control control of humans and centralized authority whilst the assassins, they fight for freedom, individual freedom. So this game that I'm talking about fits right into that. So Origins, 2018, that's when it came out. It's set in Ptolemaic Egypt, quite specifically, it's set in the reign of Cleopatra VII. And we have a, a DLC. So a DLC, for those of you who are not into games, it's a kind of um, extra narrative, extra adventure that you can download in addition to the main narrative. And the DLC is called The Curse of the Pharaohs. And you can see the promotional image for it here. I think we can all recognize who this, this is supposed to be. It's meant to be Nefertiti. And then of course we have the, the little ghost mummy warriors at the bottom. So we have a, we have a protagonist, his name is Bayek. He's from Siwa Oasis. He is traveling all over Egypt to do various things. Um, and in the DLC, he travels to Luxor because he has heard rumors of resurrected pharaohs from the Valley of the Kings who have started haunting the streets of Luxor. And we find that these pharaohs specifically are Tutankhamun, Akhenaten, Nefertiti, and also Ramesses II. So these four pharaohs are kind of like ghosts, they can suddenly reappear on the spot and then they can vanish again when you try to fight them. So these are quite dangerous. And Bayek, as the protagonist, has to find the cause of these resurrections and he must also put the restless spirit back to sleep. So 
one of the things we find is that this kind of curse hasn't come about randomly or by accident. We find that the reason why they have been resurrected is because during their lifetimes, all of these pharaohs were in possession or in contact with one of these Isu artifacts. And it's called the Apple of Eden. Okay, I see this is amusing. That's good. Um, so, so the Apple of Eden is, um, is an Isu artifact. It's a round little object. And we are told through various in-game documents and dialogue, we are told that Akhenaten and Nefertiti were particularly influenced by this Apple of Eden. And they came to view it as the divine sun disk Aten. So this is what I mean. These are very mystical artifacts. They, they have the ability to, to influence people with mind control and things like that. And Tutankhamun realized, presumably as a young child, he, he realized the immense power of this apple of Eden. So he gave it to the priesthood of Amun, who kept it in the Karnak temple for safekeeping. And of course, Ramesses II, he later found it. And he used it as a, as a war kind of, as, as a sort of weapon when he was fighting in the Battle of Kadesh. Uh, and after he died, the apple was once again taken to Karnak for safekeeping. So here we see Nefertiti in a, this is an image from a cutscene where she's shown sort of worshiping the, the apple of Eden as the Aten. So in order for Bayek to investigate all of this, he has to explore the tombs in the Valley of the Kings, which is very faithfully reconstructed. And in doing so, he essentially reenacts the activities of archaeologists such as Howard Carter. So not only is he following in the footsteps of, of real life archaeologists, he's also following the action adventure convention of the hero archaeologist, which is a type of figure that we see in other types of uh, franchises, such as Indiana Jones, we see Lara Croft in Tomb Raider doing the same thing, and Nathan Drake in Uncharted. So the hero archaeologist is a bit of a, an archetype that we see in these sort of games. And Bayek fits into that mold. He's shown to be very knowledgeable about the ancient objects in the ancient tombs. So in addition to, to being faithful reconstructions of the, of the real life tombs, in the game, we, we see that these tombs have some sort of portal to another dimension. And in this dimension, this is where Bayek must face the pharaohs in battle in order to put them to rest, not to kill them, but to put them to rest. And when we enter the dimension that Tutankhamun is located in, it's given the name the Duat. This is what it looks like. And through uh, basically in, in this location, not only are we going to face Tutankhamun in battle, we have to look for various little documents, such as um, an in-game adaptation of the restoration stealer. And these documents that we read in the game, they are based on real textual material from Egypt. Um, these shed light on the Amarna period. And, uh, and this also helps the game to serve a bit of an educational purpose as well for, for a lay audience. So this is uh, the, re the restoration steel I'm talking about. So here we see Bayek, it's golden. You'll notice that, it's lots of gold. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you'll see that Bayek is he's shown as being able to read the ancient text. And we are told here that Tutankhamun brought us back from the darkness to the, to the true ones. So the true ones being the gods. So this, this is the in-game adaptation of the, rest uh, of the restoration stealer. So we are told, we as the gamers are told explicitly that Tutankhamun is someone who, who restored, he restored things back to their natural order. So what this does in practice is to put Tutankhamun and Akhenaten into some sort of dialectical opposite pairing. And here you see Akhenaten as he is portrayed in the game. This is literally what he looks like as, as, as a ferocious opponent. So we are told repeatedly that Akhenaten is the heretic king. This comes up a lot in the in-game dialogue and in the various documents we, we find. And by contrast, Tutankhamun is the restorer who returned to, to, to the traditional cults. And that means that these two figures of Tutankhamun 
and Akhenaten, they are only really seen as meaningful in relationship to each other. They don't really, they're not really meaningful independently. So the pairing is what's significant. Because Tutankhamun can't be a restorer without the heresy of Akhenaten. And this pairing is largely based on Egyptological scholarship because the idea of Tutankhamun as a restorer, it does come from the real life restoration stealer. So this isn't something that the, the game makers just, just made up. The, it is based on real scholarship. And of course, the, the idea of Akhenaten as a heretic, that's also based on the, on the erasing of his memory after his death. So we do get ancient Egyptian textual references calling him the enemy from Akhenaten. So again, the game isn't making this up. The protagonist Bayek is also shown as being quite disdainful towards Akhenaten because uh, Bayek is very devoted to Amun. So he doesn't particularly care for Akhenaten. So indirectly, we as the audience, we are told that we too should be disdainful of Akhenaten. So Tutankhamun the mummy, let's see how he's actually portrayed in the game. He is portrayed as a tall, bulky and ferocious enemy. So you can see him down there at the bottom and you can see that there's very clear influence from the actual real life mummy mask. There is absolutely no visual similarity between the real life mummified corpse of Tutankhamun and, and this portrayal in the game. Um, Akhenaten and Nefertiti are portrayed as more mummy-like, as you saw in the previous image. So Tutankhamun looks more like a warrior than a mummy. And this does stand in very clear contrast with this popular image of Tutankhamun as a kind of sickly boy king, or maybe even disabled boy king that a lot of people see him as. And the reason why we see this is because the, the genre of the action adventure game dictates that you must have a strong opponent. You must have this ferocious enemy to, to defeat. So you can't really have a weak or sickly opponent. It doesn't work for the genre. And you can see as well that the mummy mask, which is so famous and so well known in popular culture has had such an influence. I think most people looking at this, this figure in the game will be able to say that's Tutankhamun just because of the mask. Um, the mummies are also portrayed as being quite scary and dangerous. And this follows the cinematic convention that we see from the, for example, the, the Boris Kahlo film from 1932. So there are some cinematic tropes and conventions going on here as well. So the mummy, the mummies, they, they all play a little bit for role of a, of an avenging type of figure. So we eventually learn through our investigations that it was actually a priestess, a priestess named Isidora who retrieved the apple from the, from the vault in the Karnak temple. And she deliberately used it to resurrect these pharaohs. And you can see as well, this is what she looks like. She looks a lot like this Taylor's Cleopatra. It's a very clear influence. And the reason why she did this is because her mother was killed by grave robbers and she wanted the pharaohs to punish the grave robbers. But then she found that she couldn't actually control the artifact or the mummies. And we also see that soldiers are shown as taking valuables from the ancient tombs and moving them to nearby temples, such as the Hatshepsut temple for so-called safekeeping. The mummies are shown to attack soldiers. So it seems like that one of the primary functions of the mummies is to guard the Valley of the Kings and discourage tomb robbery. So there is a didactic purpose of this kind of curse law. It's, it's essentially a sort of criticism of tomb robbery. And the mummy takes on a function as a kind of religious figure who avenges and punishes wrongdoings um, or, or wrongdoers. And um, in contrast with the actual Tutankhamun curse that media wrote about, the, the curse that we see in the game isn't really the direct influence of entering the royal tombs. So it's the artifact that's, that, that sets off the curse. So the actual act of entering the tombs isn't really portrayed as, as a sort of vehicle or trigger for the, for the curse. So what can we, how can we summarize this? So first of all, the character of Tutankhamun is based on the historical king and it does draw on historical Egyptological scholarship. So the game serves 
both the kind of educational and entertainment function. The character is visually recognized as Tutankhamun because of the death mask. Apart from the death, death mask, there isn't really much similarity. It's the mask itself that functions in popular culture as a kind of index or icon signifying Tutankhamun. We also see that the curse law from the game draws on multiple strands. So we have the Atlantis law, we have mummy cinema, and then we also have the Tutankhamun curse law from the media, from 20th century media. The mummies are portrayed as scary and dangerous, which is a cinematic convention. And Tutankhamun and Akhenaten are portrayed in relation to each other as a kind of opposite, but the gamer is encouraged to view Tutankhamun in a favorable light as a restorer after Akhenaten's heresy. We also see that the curse of the pharaoh is caused by an Isu artifact. So the, the pharaohs themselves or the mummies themselves don't have any agency to either start or end the curse. So they are essentially vehicles being used to enact the curse, but they don't start the curse. They don't have any control over it. The portrayal of Tutankhamun as a formidable and strong opponent fulfills the gamer's expectations for the action adventure genre. And this stands in strong opposition to the well-known image that people tend to have of Tutankhamun as either sickly or, uh, or weak or disabled and, and, and very young. He's not shown as a child, for example, he's shown as a fully grown armored enemy. The mummy curse is shown as having a didactic function. It acts as critique of tomb robbery and of theft of antiquities. So the mummy is an avenging figure who attacks those who engage in these activities. And finally, the mummies are not actually killed by the protagonist, but they are shown as being put to rest when they are defeated in, in battle. The end of the curse represents a return to equilibrium. Thank you.